Hello, everyone. I'd like to get started with our presentation. I'm Joe Gravenstein from the MBDA Federal Procurement Center, and this will be the... I'm sorry, people are still logging in. Uh, can everyone on the line hear me? I'm assuming you can. If, uh, during, the, during the presentation, if you'll please keep your phones on mute. Whenever you want to ask a question, just go ahead and unmute your phone and ask the question. We will be stopping at certain points to, at, to, uh, to take questions, but it is okay if you have a question to, uh, to ask it during the presentation. We do want this to be interactive, and uh, we're looking forward to a, a great uh, presentation here from Mr. Beecher. And I just wanted to tell you a little bit about our uh, session today. This will be the first of a number of sessions to launch the MBDA Federal Procurement Working Group. Uh, the Procurement Center will be leading this group, and we will have regular monthly calls. In addition, we'll have a series of speakers. Mr. Beecher is the first speaker. He'll be talking about Corps of Engineers opportunities today. But we also have uh, Tom Lenny from the VA will be coming to talk about VA opportunities. We'll have, um, excuse me, um, a number of OSDABU directors from different agencies that will be joining us. Uh, our next presentation will be the OSDABU director from the Defense Logistics Agency. Uh, after that, we'll be having DHS, Tony Bell from DHS. We'll have uh, speakers from National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, SBA, GSA, and uh, a number of other agencies. So we're looking forward to a very interesting series of sessions and uh, great speakers, and each session will be centered around actual upcoming opportunities, particularly small business or minority uh, focused opportunities, not minority focused, but opportunities that would be, be uh, a great fit for our clients, the clients of MBDA. We'll also be conducting monthly sessions, uh, monthly conference calls for the Federal Procurement Working Group, and the purpose of this group and those calls will be to facilitate more collaboration with the MBDA centers uh, so that we can help more minority-owned businesses to target federal opportunities. We'll also be distributing federal, federal opportunities and discussing any issues that, that pertain to federal procurement. I'd like to turn it over to Patricia Luna, and Patricia Luna will be... Uh, I'm sorry, did someone have a question? No, no, okay. I'm sorry. Okay, so that's fine. We're going to go, go ahead and turn this over to Dr. Patricia Luna. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Welcome once again to the exciting forum with Mr. Jack Fisher, who recently retired from the Army Corps of Engineers, or USACI, as we might be using the acronym very frequently today. Um, our goal for the, these federal sessions is one, receive an understanding of the mission of respective agencies. Two, for information about navigating the agency from our guest speakers. And three, insight on some upcoming opportunities within the agency. Our speaker today has prepared an amazing presentation that covers all three areas, and we're thrilled that Mr. Beecher has not only researched, but is going to present on 25 contracting opportunities. This being our first of many Said, I must say, he certainly set the bar very high. Jack recently retired from the Norfolk District Corps of Engineers after a career that spanned 40 years, including his time in the active Army tour of duty in Vietnam in 19. Jack has been with the Army for five years. While with the Norfolk positions range an entry level surveying tech to the Deputy Chief of Contracting, to the Chief of the York District Small Business Programs Office. The latter position Jack held for about 15 years, he says, were the most engaging and fulfilling years with USACI. During those years, the Norfolk became one of the best in USACI in terms of getting contracts into the hands of small businesses. During one five-year period, Norfolk District averaged 51% total program dollars to spend across the region. In 2008, Jack was the Chief of Engineers as Program Manager for the government's newest small business category, Service Disabled Veteran-Owned Small Businesses, or SBO. He led the best command in the and contract awards to Service Disabled Veteran-Owned Small Businesses. You say he exceeded that statutory goal three years in a row and was a major factor in the Army exceeding 
three percent for the first time since 2012. Jack, although retired from the Army Corps, is not retired from assisting small businesses. He continues to consult with businesses across the country to help facilitate their desire to get involved in federal government small business programs. After 45 years with the Army, Jack is still driven to serve, and we thank you, sir, for your service and for taking the time to, to offer your expertise with us today. Please welcome Mr. Jack Beecher. Thank you, Patricia, for that uh, great introduction, and I want to thank uh, Joe and Patricia for inviting me here today and, uh, and also to the MBDA for inviting me here today. As Patricia said, uh, I'm retired from the Army Corps of Engineers uh, out of the Norfolk District, spent my entire career there, 43 years out of the Norfolk District. I was one of the, uh, one of the folks who came to the... Uh, it's it's a little it's a little rare in this time. Uh, people will go to a core district or a division, and sometimes within three, four, five years, uh, they've moved on to another district, another division. But uh, I just off of, or the Tidewater area was my home. My family's there, so I just stayed in Norfolk. I was asked uh, right before I retired, Jack, when are you going to retire? Uh, I believe at the time I was second uh, in the district in terms of there was one lady there, uh, 48 years in Norfolk District. So I retired uh, for a lot of reasons. One of those is something called sequel. I think that affected, obviously, uh, small business companies, but it also had effect on federal agencies. Uh, one of the ways it infected, uh, affected the Corps of Engineers and my office was I was told that uh, by, uh, going to conferences like going to events like this held uh, just events held in the Norfolk area, that uh, travel would be restricted. Uh, and I really enjoy getting out to conference events like this. That was one reason. Another reason was... Uh, Poles coming to the Midtown Tunnel. Uh, that was a factor in my retirement, as well as some other other things that that, uh, that caused me to go ahead and retire. But as Patricia said, I'm retired from engineers, really retired from small businesses. I have LLC, as you can see on the screen, I believe, uh, Jack Beecher LLC, Limited Liability Corporation. I use that LLC. Uh, to go to events like this, uh, to uh, speak for various uh, federal agencies as well as uh, agencies like VA. Also, I'm working part time for a company called the Mahorsky Group. Is a they focus on helping small businesses in the construction industry. And as many of you know, if you're in construction out there, uh, that can be a challenge to uh, some small businesses, and especially for small businesses just getting started. Uh, as Patricia said, uh, I was the program manager for the service disabled veteran-owned small business category uh, uh, for about 15 years, actually about 12. And bonding was a challenge for those young companies just forming. Uh, and so the Mahorsky Group has been uh, focused on service disabled uh, as well as ADA uh, or any small business organization. So uh, that's what I'm doing now. Uh, just a quick overview of what I'm, I'm going to do over the next hour or so. I'm going to give you a brief overview, as Patricia said, of the Corps of Engineers and, and the way that agency is structured and how small businesses can get involved in, in working with the Corps as, as a contractor. Uh, I'm also going to go over uh, about $2 billion uh, worth of small business opportunities that I've been tracking over the last uh, four or five months. Uh, things are starting to break within the federal marketplace. I think many of you probably realized FY13 was not such a good year uh, in the federal marketplace with uh, sequestration and other, other budget constraints. 
Uh, I think FY14 is starting to pick up some now, and you're going to see uh, you know, a steady increase in opportunities as we get into FY15. Also have at the latter part of my presentation something I call tips for success. You know, I, I've, I've done a lot of presentations like this uh, when I was with the Corps, and one year one of my bosses, uh, uh, Colonel, Colonel Backus, said, Jack, I've reviewed your presentations. They're great information. You, you know, you have forecast. You have what Norfolk's done. Uh, but I want to hear you give contractors some tips for success, things that you've learned over your career, things that they could do to maybe help them win some of those contracts. So I had to think about that for a while, but, but sit down and came up with uh, about 12 different tips, tips for success that I think can help uh, all small businesses be more successful. And then we're going to have a Q&A at the end, but as uh, Patricia and Joe said, if you have a question, a burning question, uh, that you want to raise, just uh, just just uh, call in and, and we'll, uh, we'll answer that question as we go. All right, let's get started here with the first slide. First slide is a quick overview of the mission of the Corps of Engineers. The Corps of Engineers likes to build themselves as the premier engineering and construction agency in the world. Now, they may get uh, some uh, re rebuts of that from agencies like the Navy and GSA, maybe even the VA, uh, Veterans Administration, that does construction. But the core, uh, and I guess I'm a little, uh, uh, have a little bit of a slanted view, uh, the core is an expert in uh, the uh, a and &E, architecture, engineer, design, and then construction industry. That's, that's what they're, they're known for. If I had to come up with the, the, the big four, I call it, the types of, of awards that the Corps of Engineers does, it would be construction, environmental contracts, A&E design contracts, and I know there's uh, at least one architect engineer firm uh, in the room here today, and also dredging. So those are the big four. Now, the Corps of Engineers buys a lot of other things, uh, office supplies, furniture, et cetera, but by far the, the most, most of their dollars as far as uh, their spends is in construction, environmental, A&E, and dredging. The Corps of Engineers is part of the Army. Uh, now, the Corps uh, had at the time 45,000 employees. Down some, you're around 35 now, 35 employees across the country, across the world actually. Most of them are civilians, but every Corps of Engineers, just, I'll go over some of them later in the video, uh, there is a military commander. It's either at the district level, it's either a full bird colonel or a lieutenant colonel. At the headquarters level, there's a three star general. Uh, Two star and a one star. So the Corps is definitely uh, an organization that is run by military officers, uh, commanded by military officers, but we're we're very uh, heavily staffed uh, with uh, civilians. So we are part of the part of the army. You'll hear me say we. I'm still trying to get out of that uh, that habit. So just uh, forgive me if you hear me say we. The next slide, and I hope you can see it well, it's uh, basically a map of the United States that, that gives the uh, nine divisions. There are seven statewide and two uh, overseas. Overseas uh, divisions include the Pacific Ocean Division and the Transatlantic Division. Now, the Corps uh, used to have a district in Iraq. Uh, that one has been uh, stood down. But there are still two uh, two districts in Afghanistan as they're winding up work there. Uh, stateside, there are seven divisions, as you can see on the slide. Now, many of you uh, out there today probably are more focused on the North Atlantic Division. That would be uh, districts that go up to New England, and then coming down would be New York, Philadelphia. Baltimore District right here uh, in your backyard that handles the uh, Washington Capital Region. And then my, my district that I came from is the, the Norfolk District. So that's the North Atlantic Division. 
going further south is the South Atlantic Division. So the, those two divisions basically cover the eastern seaboard. And basically is what I am monitoring uh, with my LLC. I, I look for opportunities for small businesses basically from Maine to Florida in, in those two divisions, North Atlantic and the uh, South Atlantic Division. Points of contact for the, the Corps of Engineers. Obviously, ever, every agency has a home page. Uh, USAIDS has a good one, I believe, and there is the, uh, the home page uh, uh, site for that. A lot of information is on the Corps of Engineers headquarters home page. Uh, mission, uh, you, you'll learn there more in more detail what the Corps of Engineers does. Uh, obviously, district locations where all the districts are located and points of contacts. Uh, but more importantly, I think, is also probably a list there of each district web page. So if you're focusing, say, for example, on the Norfolk District, you're in Virginia, you can go to the Norfolk District website and pull up the Norfolk District forecast, which will be a forecast of contracting opportunities coming out of the Norfolk District uh, for, in most districts will have a two-year forecast, FY14 and 15. Beyond that, it's a little soft, but a lot of good information uh, on the uh, headquarters web page as well as the district web pages. I also might add here at this point, uh, districts within the Corps of Engineers is where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. That's where the contracts are awarded. Headquarters here in Washington is a, obviously a great organization, but they don't award contracts. So if you're if you're interested in, in, in tracking contracts, Awards, or you're interested in awards, uh, but through the Corps of Engineers, you're not because they're they're simply going to direct you to Norfolk or Charleston or the LA district, wherever you're interested in in marketing. Very important on that slide: uh, the email addresses uh, and contacts for the small business address. We call those Abu from that name. They're now, at least within Army, uh, called the uh, Deputies for Small Business. Uh, so each district has a Deputy for Small Business or a Small Business Advocate. Uh, you can find those there. Those are your first points of contact for any Corps of, Corps of Engineers district or division. So if you're interested in marketing, again, the Norfolk district, my replacement there is a, a guy by the name of Adam Ball. You can find Adam's information uh, at the Norfolk District website. And uh, what you would do is contact Adam, make an appointment to come in, meet with him, uh, where he'll listen to your uh, capabilities and then tell you what opportunities may be coming out of the Norfolk District that he could assist you with. And that's kind of the way that, that works with all the core districts. Your first point of contact is with that small business chief because he or she knows what, the, what that district has coming up this fiscal year and, and into FY15, and they also know project managers and contracting officers within the district who uh, have those particular procurements. So that's kind of a brief overview of the Corps of Engineers. Any question on, on what I just went over, I'll stop here briefly and see if you have any questions at this point. All right. Uh, the next slide, what, what you see on this slide is, is uh, the small business, federal small business goals uh, that each agent, the Corps of Engineers, but the Army, the Guard, the Air Force, they all have uh, these goals to meet that you see on the slide. Uh, small business, 23% of that agency's Total procurement dollars. It's not percentage of contract, total procurement dollars. 23% should be set aside for small business participation. Women owned. Uh, this particular small business category has been out there for, for years, obviously. Uh, when I was in the Norfolk District, we had a woman owned goal. It was 5%, uh, the statutory goal. Really had no teeth at the time to do women owned set asides. That has changed. Uh, Congress finally instructed the SBA uh, to look into uh, 
ways that they could uh, put into effect uh, set-aside programs for women-owned. You're gonna, I'm going to show you some of those coming out now. Uh, they're in most of the, of the NAICS codes. Uh, some of the uh, general construction NAICS codes are restricted, but there are other construction NAICS codes where you can do women-owned small business. Small disadvantaged business, now that's synonymous with the 8A program. Many, many people think that uh, federal agencies have 8A goals. They do not. There's no 8A goal. 8A is just a tool. Section 8A of the Small Business Act will allow agencies to do either 8A set-asides or 8A sole source uh, awards, and those are 8As are companies small disadvantaged business. So we have a small disadvantaged business goal, and, and some agencies will use the 8A uh, uh, statute uh, to help meet small disadvantaged business targets and goals. Historically underutilized business zone, a hub zone program that's been around now for probably 15, 18 years. Uh, Three percent is the statute gold on that. Uh, contracting officers do have the ability to do zone set asides. I'm going to show you those a little later on in my. And then the one that's uh, dear to my heart is the last one on the screen: uh, service disabled, veteran-owned small businesses. Uh, 3% statutory goals sold to all federal agencies. Uh, that law, Public Law 106 was enacted back in 1999. Uh, the sad thing is that not many agencies uh, have met that goal uh, over the last 14, year, 14 or 15 years now. Uh, Corps of Engineers, I'm proud to say, uh, met, has met that goal the last four years. FY, uh, 10 through uh, 13, uh, and, uh, and from what I understand, they're well on their way to meeting again in FY14. So service disabled vet, a uh, very important uh, small business category. We should be, I uh, think, in the federal government doing as many set aside as possible uh, when it's practical to do so uh, for the men and women who served our country. The next several slides is I'm going to go over some actual uh, small business opportunities that, that I've been tracking. Uh, probably the next three or four slides are going to be uh, IDIQ contracts or, or MATOX or MAX, and I'll explain uh, that terminology a little, little later. But uh, let's get right into that first one. And by the way, this one happens to be the largest small business, largest 8A uh, IDIQ that I've ever seen. And again, I, I was with the Corps 43 years, of, uh, all that time in the Norfolk District, and the majority of that time doing small business. This is an 8A uh, IDIQ out of, out of GSA, total dollar value $500 million over the next five years. Uh, I believe that one uh, is under evaluation now. So the ability to uh, compete on that is now closed, but GSA is going to want to award up to 10 contracts to uh, various uh, 8A companies. So do, do that on that, folks. Uh, GSA uh, is going to expect those 10 8A companies to do somewhere, if cause the work's divided up evenly, and it never is, by the way, to do somewhere between $50 million uh, over the next five years each. So it's a, it's a significant contract. As they put out there for the 8A community. Now, coming out of that contract, obviously, uh, GSA is going to award to general contractors, general construction companies, but a lot of small business opportunities as, as, a, as a subcontractor or a supplier. So if you're not necessarily in the construction industry, in the sound of my voice, uh, there's still hope uh, that you can do work either as a subcontractor or a supplier in some of these large uh, IDIQs I'm going to share with you. Uh, the next one there, and I'm really excited about this one, it's out of the Mobile District, a small business set aside. Uh, might as well say 500 mil, but it's 499. Why, why they left off $1 million and decided to go 499, uh, I don't know. But I like Mobile's acquisition strategy. They put that out there as a small business set aside, but they're going to select one small business, one 8A, one hub zone, one service disabled. So you can see their share in the wealth 
And also, Mobile is going to, going to help themselves, if you will, by over the next five years hitting targets and goals in all those categories. Uh, obviously, Mobile has uh, targets to hit in small business, 8A, hub zones, label. And, and they, they believe, and I agree, that by putting a small business set aside out there, and then by selecting uh, small businesses in each of those categories, it will not only help a lot of different small businesses in those categories, various categories, but it's going to help them hit their their, uh, their small business goals. I think it's a it's a unique, uh, a very effective small business strategy. And by the way, I called Mobile and told them that. I said, I, I, this is very unique and innovative. I'd like to see more uh, Corps of Engineers do that, and they uh, they agreed. They said, we, uh, we like this approach. Over on the screen there is a, a MAC. By the way, a MATOC. So, it's an IDIQ that the Army puts a, a name on it. It's a multiple award task order contract, but it's in the IDIQ, indefinite, free, indefinite quantity family of contracts. The Navy has a MAC out there. The Navy calls it calls these uh, IDIQs multiple award construction contracts. Uh, 8A, com competitive at $95 million over the next five years. Now that work is going to be in what the Navy calls their Mid-Atlantic region, uh, Virginia and North Carolina. Navy has another MAC out there, a hub zone set aside uh, at 90 mil. Uh, in uh, work in North Carolina. Now, the way these IDIQs and MACs work, just briefly explain that to you, there's going to be a lot of competition, obviously. A lot of A days, a lot of hub zones, uh, and small businesses are going to, going to submit. Uh, these districts and, and GSA and Navy will select in up to, say, 10 on that GSA contract, and then they're going to compete again among those 10 for that $500 million out of money. That's kind of kind of the way that works. It's almost like a second round of competition, only it's restricted to the companies that win those MATOCs. Uh, most of these will go out on, on what is called best value RFP as, as opposed to the uh, seal bid. It will give the agencies the flexibility to look, to look not just at price, the capability expertise, et cetera, uh, of those companies. And hopefully they'll select, in GSA's case, the top, top 10 8A companies that submit, uh, and then they'll compete uh, on that 500 million pound of money among those 8A companies. That's the new IT70, that's the 3 back. That's what I do. There's like four plus one, I was going to do four plus one. Questions on the Matox or Max? No, you should have like one. If if you could please keep your phone on mute uh, unless you have a question because we can hear you. Thank you. Okay, continuing with some more uh, Matox uh, as as well as a SATOC, and I'll explain the SATOC later. Out of the Veterans Administration, uh, the VA, by the way, a uh, lot of negative publicity lately for the VA, but but I can tell you the VA. Is is the uh, the most proactive agency out there in doing service disabled vet sit asides? As a matter of fact, they have a uh, a strategy called called uh, Vet First. So they're they're going to first look at small businesses that are service disabled and veteran owned before they they develop any other a acquisition strategy. The VA put this one out there. It's a fifty million dollar uh, MATOC. That will be for uh, work uh, at VA uh, hospitals in North Carolina. Baltimore District, right here in, uh, in, in this area, has a MATOC out there for work in West Virginia and Maryland. Uh, that's at the $30 million level. And Baltimore also has a SATOC. Now, that, that's unique. Th this is a single award task order contract. So obviously, there's going to be competition on that. It's a small business set aside. But Baltimore will select one small business. It could be an 8A. It could be service disabled. Uh, could even be a woman-owned uh, small business company. Uh, they'll, they'll select the best one uh, based on uh, the evaluation criteria. And then uh, that $49 million pot of money you see there, 
uh, will go to that one company. Of course, it'll be a negotiation process. Uh, they'll ask that company for a cost proposal, and they'll, and they'll go through the award process. But that's, uh, that's unique. You don't see a lot of SATOX. You see mostly MATOX out of, out of agencies. Out of the Mobile District, uh, the Mobile District Corps of Engineers is, is known as uh, it is the center of expertise for Army hospitals. Uh, now, besides VA hospitals, obviously, uh, the Army has uh, hospitals on, on certain Army bases. Uh, Mobile District is the Corps of Engineers center of expertise for Army hospitals. Here you see some MATOX that are, are coming up out of the Mobile District. Uh, they're divided up into regions. Uh, the first one there is the Western Region, which would include uh, Missouri West. Uh, that one is a service-disabled, veteran-owned, small business set aside, which basically means Mobile is going to restrict competition to uh, companies owned by SDBO, SBs. The other region is the Southern Region, Texas through South Carolina. Again, $49 million MATOC. Again, service-disabled to veteran-owned. I'm proud of Mobile for uh, putting those two out there for our, our SDB, SBO community. And then uh, the third MATOC, they'll be advertising small business set, a, set aside in northern region right here, uh, North Carolina through, through Maine. Uh, again, work on hospitals on Army bases uh, across the country. Uh, I might add here that, that I'm very proud that several years ago, and I know there's gentlemen in the room here who helped work on that hospital, Norfolk District was the lead district on a $1.1 billion hospital at Fort Belvoir. Uh, State-of-the-art hospital, if you ever get a chance to go by and see that hospital, it, it, is, it is the best in, in the country, I believe, on any Army base. Uh, we all know uh, Walter Reed was uh, on the BRAC list, the BRAC list, I'm sorry, and uh, it's closing, and uh, we already have uh, service-disabled veterans that were transferred from that facility to that hospital there uh, at Fort Belvoir, as well as uh, they're doing renovations at Bethesda, major renovations going on there uh, where those wounded warriors will be transferred. So that was a big project. Again, $1.1 billion that was obviously awarded to a large business. But a lot of small business work went on there in the hospital. A lot of subcontracts awarded to small businesses. The next one is uh, the largest MATOC uh, service disabled vet set aside that I've ever seen. I'm, I'm proud to say that was a Corps of Engineers contract out of the Louisville district. Uh, it will cover Kentucky, Tennessee, Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio. Those are, those are the primary states that the Louisville District services. It's, it's for construction work on, uh, on military bases in those states. That one, too, is under evaluation. So uh, the opportunity to submit on, on that one is closed. Uh, I do believe there are several Virginia-based uh, service-disabled veteran-owned companies who submitted on that uh, and will be, uh, will be considered. It's a nice, uh, a nice mate talk <clears throat> for our service-disabled vet community. I want to get away from a lot of those large MATOX and, and SATOX and, and give you some examples of some smaller procurements that I've been tracking. Now, these are going to range from as much as $10 million to uh, less than $25,000. So there's something there for everyone. Uh, out of the Norfolk District, competitive 8A, uh, to do some work there at Fort Lee between $1 and $5 million. But by the way, that's a, that's a range, a, a district or an agency can't obviously post the government estimate, uh, but, but they can give you a range of, of what that procurement is worth, and that one's between one and five. Another competitive 8A out of Department of Energy right here in, in uh, D.C. For, uh, for the Department of Energy being handled by the GSA. That's an 8A compete. Why is it an 8A compete? Because it's over the $4 million sole source uh, cap on, on 8A companies. And right here at Andrews Air Force Base, another 8A compete, five to ten million dollars, a training facility at Andrews Air Force Base. 
the small business sit aside out of the Navy there at Camp Lejeune, uh, one to five mil. Uh, and there are a few women-owned set-asides. Uh, that second bullet shows you one right here at Fort Detrick, which is uh, obviously uh, right in the backyard here of most of you in the sound of my voice. Uh, replacement towers there at Fort Detrick, between 500 and $1 million. And then a small business sit aside out of uh, GSA to renovate the State Department building. That's right here in, in D.C. So uh, a lot of work right here in this area. Again, mostly construction. Before I move on, any questions? Another project, this is out of the Wilmington District. This is a small business set aside to do work at Fort Bragg. Fort Bragg, by the way, is one of the, uh, one of the key, uh, one of the largest Army bases in the country. 82nd Airborne is headquartered out of there and a lot of activity, a lot of building going on at Fort Bragg. Uh, Ferry Point, uh, that's out of the VA. Uh, that's a service disabled vet set aside between 500K and a million. Actually, there's two there uh, at Perry Point. Close to my home there out of Hampton, Virginia, the VA has a service disabled vet set aside uh, to uh, work on uh, renovations of Building 27. Again, $25,000 to $100,000 uh, is the size of that procurement. I just wanted to share with you some of the smaller procurements uh, that I've been tracking, as well as some of those very large ones. Uh, here at Fort Detrick, service disabled vet set aside, that, that one is less than $25,000. By the way, I get a lot of calls from, from companies wanting to know about those procurements, mainly because they, they're, they're challenged with their bonding. Under 25, a contracting officer, actually under 100,000, a contracting officer does not have to require a bond from a construction company because of the small dollar value. Okay, let me back up some, because these are supposed to come in one at a time, but, but they're not, so I'm just going to start off. Uh, th this is my tips for success slide. Basically, it's uh, uh, things that I've uh, uh, come up with uh, over, the, over the years in dealing with small businesses that I think uh, they need to start doing in order to put themselves in better position to win some of these contracts. Uh, the first thing is... is they have to have some capability and past performance history in the type of procurement that an agency has out there. Now, many of you may think, well, that's, that's obvious, but some small businesses might not, re might, might not real realize that. They see a procurement and they think, well, that's not what I do, but I, I know a company that does it and I'll team with them. You can award the contract to me, but, uh, but I'll sub it out to them. Uh, let me give you an example of how, how that uh, is not the case. Several years ago, while I was at the Corps, Norfolk District, we did a service disabled vet set aside for a $50 million construction MATOC at Arlington National Cemetery. Uh, the Corps of Engineers started doing work at Arlington well, about three or four years ago. Again, it was a construction project at Arlington. Arlington has about $50 million worth of renovations they're going to do out there. So Norfolk District put it out as a service disabled vet set aside. I got a call from a service disabled veteran owned company, legitimate company, who was an IT, information technology company. And they say to me over the phone, Jack, I'm service disabled, I'm, I'm certified by the Veterans Administration. I want to go after that, that MATOC. Uh, and I, want to, I have a, a friend of mine who owns a construction company. They're not service disabled, they're a small business. I'll take that project as the lead service disabled, and I'll sub the work to them, all the work. And I was asked by that individual, uh, what did I think his chances were of winning that contract, and I told him zero, zero chances, because you're an IT company. The evaluation criteria is going to ask you for the uh, number of construction projects you've done in the last five years, the dollar value of them, et cetera. You yourself need to be in the construction business to go after that construction may talk at Arlington. So you have to have capability, past performance history uh, in whatever type of work uh, that you're going after. You may, not, you may not be able to do all the work yourself. You may have to bring in subs. That's fine. But you need to go in to perform, have to perform at least 
of the Dalla Valley of that procurement with your own forces. Uh, the federal government is not looking to award contracts to uh, general contractors, and then those, G those GCs sub it all out. It's called a pass-through, and it's not something that, that we want to do. A company has to have, an, and I'll go uh, left to right on this and work down, financial stability. And I, again, I'm talking more about construction companies here. And what do I mean by that? Uh, several years ago, Norfolk District awarded a, a contract to build a dining facility, a new dining facility at Fort Lee, which was a, a, a BRAC base that was gaining uh, uh, soldiers. So we had to build up Fort Lee, built four dining facilities there. One of those was to a service-disabled veteran-owned company out of Williamsburg by the name of Liebcorp. Liebcorp got that award at about $6.9 million, a nice, nice dining facility project for them. With that award, Liebcor got an award letter that said basically said, "Congratulations, you've you've been awarded this contract. Uh, we now need your your bonds." Do you think the Corps of Engineers also sent Liebcor a check in the advanced funding? The answer is no. Uh, that's not the way it works in a construction project. They get that award letter, they get their bonds in, then they're given something called a notice to proceed. They actually have to start work. In this case, it was to clear a 30-acre site that was completely wooded. So basically, Liebcorp had to hire a site company to come out there and do that work, clear that site. That site company bills Liebcorp, bill, Liebcorp bills the Corps of Engineers, and uh, then we pay Liebcorp, and Liebcorp pays the, the sub. That's kind of the way that works. But in order to do that, Liebcorp had to have some financial stability. They had to be able to pay subs in advance. Uh, for work performed. Uh, another thing that small businesses need to do, they obviously need to be in SAM. Now, SAM is the System for Acquisition Management. It used to be called the old, uh, the old CCR, Central Contractor Register. But in order to get a federal contract, you as a small business or large, you have to be in SAM. If you're not there, even if you're the low bid or, or the company that is selected in the best value, the contracting officer goes to SAM to pull your data in. You're not there. They can't make that award. So you need to go to SAME.gov and register. If you're a service-disabled, veteran-owned company, you need to go through the VA and get registered in something called VetBiz. It's not a requirement for any federal agency except for the VA. The VA cannot award you a contract as a service-disabled vet if you're not in VetBiz. The Corps of Engineers can. The Navy can. But I'm here to tell you that eventually, I believe Congress is going to tell the VA to run, uh, and all, all agencies, to run service-disabled vet awards through that vet biz. So I think that's coming. So if you're service-disabled, you may as well register in vet biz. Marketing, uh, FBO is fed biz ops, sources sought. Uh, if you're a small business and you're in SAM, don't expect to sit back and have a Corps of Engineers call you because they see you in SAM. It doesn't work that way. You, you need to get out to each of the core districts or the Navy installations that you want to uh, approach, that you want to market, and let them know who you are. Let them know what your capabilities are. Uh, find out what they have coming as far as procurements and then target those particular procurements. So you have to market yourself. Some companies are good at that, some aren't. I know some companies that the business owner is very good in what he or she does, but they're terrible in marketing the company. So they'll actually hire people to go out and market for them. That's fine. But you, but you need to get out and tell Corps of Engineers districts and Navy facilities, GSA and others, who you are and what you do. You need to follow the Fed FedBizOps, FBO.gov. Register there. That's where the federal government advertises all of their procurements in excess of $25,000. They have to go in there, in the Fed Biz Ops, and then you as a small business can track what's out there, what's being competed, uh, and make a business decision whether you uh, want to go after those or not. Everything that I went over earlier on those slides was in the Fed Biz Ops at some point in time. Also tell small businesses respond to sources sought. I've heard it said that Hey, if it's, in the, if, it's, if it's a source is sought or if it's in the Fed biz ops, uh, then it's, it's uh, you know, the agency has someone in mind, and that, that's not the case. 
in most cases, well, in all cases where the source is sought, the agency is saying, I have this procurement to know what small businesses are out there. If small businesses do not respond, then it's probably going to go unrestricted, which means large businesses can now be involved uh, in, in the bidding process. So small businesses, you see something out there, if you can do it, respond to that source of thought. It helps that contracting officer make uh, appropriate small business decisions. I tell small businesses, have a working knowledge of the FAR. That's the Federal Acquisition Regulation. And by that I mean uh, you, you, nobody's an expert. You know, I was a contracting officer for 25 years. I still don't know all parts of all parts of the FAR. Don't quite understand it, but uh, you have to be have a working knowledge of it. Let's say you're in construction. You need to read FAR Part 36 because that covers uh, the federal construction industry, the federal construction program. So read FAR Part 36 and have a working knowledge of that. If you're a small business. FAR Part 19 is the federal acquisition regulation that you want to become familiar with so you understand what contracting officers are, are required to do, uh, and it's all laid out there for you in, in the FAR. So have, have that working knowledge. You must be cost effective. You know, just because a procurement is an 8A day set aside or even an 8A day sole source, does it mean that uh, small businesses uh, can, uh, if you will, pad uh, their cost proposals, put excessive overhead rates in, excessive profits? Because if they do, they're not likely to get that award. A contracting officer still has to go through a price reasonableness determination. So again, even though it's a, a set-aside, uh, you still have to be cost-effective. If uh, Leapcore, who built that 90 facility for us at Fort Lee, had come in at, say, $8 million on that particular 90 facility. The core knew it should cost about 7. They came in at 6.9. Uh, we would we would not have been able to make that award, even though we had gone through a pretty lengthy advertising process and evaluation process. We'd have had to cancel. So you have to be cost effective. Top left, uh, integrity and honesty. Now, this is something that contractor, contracting officers uh, really have a hard time evaluating. It, it's, you can't put it in as an evaluation criteria. Obvi in most cases, contracting officers don't find out that they've got a dishonest contractor until after the award and they're into that contract and, and things start to happen. I tell small businesses, especially service disabled, you need to build integrity and honesty into the fabric of who you are as a as an individual and as a company. And the reason I say that, I said especially uh, service disabled, uh, there has been audits by both uh, uh, the IG and by Army Audit a Agency that showed uh, some fraud in the service disabled vet program going back eight or nine years ago now, not quite that far back, may, maybe five. Uh, in some cases, there, there were companies going into the CCR at the time, and now SAM certifying that they were service disabled, and then going after service disabled vet set asides, and guess what? Winning them and getting, in one case, a company got up to $10 million in awards as a service disabled, and then it was later found out the company owner was never in the military. So it's, it's pretty easy to be dishonest and going, going to SAM and maybe falsely certify, because in most cases, core contracting officers especially, they're not going to take the time uh, to investigate whether or not someone is, is, uh, is uh, in SAM correctly. But I think that's starting to change. You're, you're going to see more uh, of, uh, of, a, of a process of evaluating contractors to make sure they're who they say they are. But again, build integrity and honesty into who you are as a company and as an individual, and uh, it'll be best for all concerned. Uh, SBA, a Small Business Administration, and PTAC, Procurement Technical Assistance Centers. And I'll add the MBDA in here. Uh, most of you are here, are listening to me, are here because uh, MBDA. Uh, there are agencies out there who it's their job to help you. Uh, 
I've actually had companies come to me in the Norfolk District when I was there, had never been to the SBA, their small business. They come into the Norfolk District wanting to know how to how to get certified, how to become a small business. And I'm like, that's not what the Corps of Engineers does. Go to the SBA. The SBA is the Small Business Administration. They're the only agency with the word small business in, in their title. They're there to help you get set up, help you get organized. And then, of course, the PTAX and the MBDA uh, are there to help you, uh, even in marketing and, uh, and finding out who these federal agencies are that you can market. I tell companies to focus on a specific business line or two. Uh, I was always a little bit leery of small businesses coming in and saying, Jack, I can do anything the Norfolk District does. If you need a dredge, I can get a dredge. I can sell you office supplies. I can, build, I can do construction. Oh, by the way, I can also do A&E design. I was a little bit leery of them because it was my experience that uh, they were spreading themselves too thin and they were not re good, really good in any one thing. Uh, so I say focus on a specific business line or two. You know, you, you can diversify some, but don't try to do it all because then you won't, you won't be a quality contractor. Teaming. JV stands for joint venturing. MP stands for mentor-protege program. Small businesses especially may need to do this. I mean, I just showed you procurements that were $500 million uh, over five years. There aren't many small businesses on their own who can handle that size of a procurement. So you may need to, uh, to team up. Uh, and teaming is authorized, by the way. FAR Part 9.6 talks about teaming agreements. Talks about how contracting officers shall consider teaming agreements when it's appropriate. So don't be afraid to team up to make yourself stronger, to make yourself um, uh, bigger, if you will, when there is a need to do that. You can even go so far as to form a joint venture or a legal joint venture. If you're a small business, because sometimes forming those joint ventures, then that entity becomes a large business. You can't go after a set aside. So you have to make sure that that when that JV is formed, that those two entities don't exceed the small business size standard for whatever procurement you're going after. Then there's something called the Mentor-Protege Program. Many of you probably heard of this. It's a, it's a government-sponsored program. GSA has one. DOD has a Mentor-Protege Program. I think the Navy has one. And it's designed for large businesses to come in and team up, if you will, with small businesses. So they make themselves larger, they make themselves uh, better able to handle some of these large procurements, maybe even bonding uh, will come from that large mentor. But you have to go through that program, it has to be uh, a process. Uh, GSA has a good one, my friend Tony Elam with GSA runs the GSA Mentor Protege Program. So again, it depends upon who you are, what size procurements you're going after, you may need to do one of these three things. You also need to provide quality products and services. I tell small businesses, and I told them this for years, in Norfolk District, you may get the first contract with us because you come in and you market it and you, you, you look good to us and we award you a contract. But unless you go out there and do a good quality job on that project, it, it could be one and done. Uh, the Corps of Engineers uh, is a very unforgiving agency when it comes to that. We will not, in most cases, go back to a company when they've done poor quality work. I tell construction companies, you got to have a good accountant and a good attorney. And I also go further than that, and I say if you're in construction, it needs to be an accountant that is familiar with construction industry and an attorney that is familiar with the construction industry. There are some accountants and attorneys that, that don't focus on construction, uh, and uh, that could come back to, to haunt you you have a good accountant attorney understand the federal construction program. Bond in, uh, it's a must for construction companies. You need to get your bonding in place. You go after a procurement. In most cases, agencies are going to ask for a bid bond and then, then uh, prior to award, payment. have those in place. Have it Bonding company, they can They probably won't award that contract. Matter of fact, I know they won't award. Uh, you'll, you'll be concerned, not responsible. So, 
get your bonding in place. And I work for a bonding company, the Mohorsky Group. They're the best I know in helping small businesses. They're very proactive. They're experts in what what they call special bonding programs. They so if a construction company has a million dollars single contract. They can give you a half or two million. They're they're very proactive and, and, and good. That kind of assistance. Uh, feel free to contact me. I'll give you my information a little bit later on. And the last thing I tell small businesses is you've got to have patience and determination. You, you, you can't be a small business company going after construction contracts and just quit after the second time you don't win a bid or the second time you don't get selected. In some cases, it may, it may take 10, 15 attempts at it before you win that first contract. Matter of fact, I think uh, the SBA uh, did a study, and most 8A companies don't win contracts for the first two years. So you, you have to be in it for the long haul. You have to be willing uh, to spend some money in proposal preparation cost uh, and maybe not and not recoup that money. It uh, has to be a cost of doing business. But patience and determination, the, the, the ones that stay in it longer, the ones that submit bids and proposals get rejected, but get those... Uh, uh, debriefs and then correct what they may have done wrong or where they were deficient, they usually end up doing pretty well. So again, patience and determination is a, is a key in the federal market. We're going to go into uh, Q&A and discussions here in a few minutes, but uh, I want to go ahead and give you my contact information. It's on the screen now. Again, I do have my own LLC, but I work for the Mahorsky Group, and there's my email address uh, for them. Uh, you can contact me there. You also see my cell phone number on the screen. And I believe these slides are going to be provided to you. Is that right, uh, Patricia? So we'll, the slides will be provided to you, so you have that information. I'll go back to the... Q&A slide here, and if anyone has any questions of, of me or, or Joe or Patricia, we'd be glad to, uh, to answer them. Yes, ma'am. So you have a consulting service that is a pay service that assists contractors in getting awards. Are you tailoring them or helping them to prepare for an award? Right. Yes. Yes, I do. I, uh, the question was, do I have a company, LLC, that will help small businesses uh, in better preparing themselves to win contracts? And yes. If, if you contact me and you tell me what uh, area of the country that you're interested in focusing on, what agency, uh, what you do, uh, then I'll be able to help you, I, I believe, uh, focus on that specific agency if that's what you want to do. Yes. Okay. Uh, can you go a little bit into the quality assurance uh, program that, uh, that the Corps puts forth? Okay. The question was, can I go over the quality assurance program that the Corps of Engineers has? Uh, and and uh, although I'm not an expert on it, Charles, I, I'll, I'll tell you what I do know about it. The Corps does institute, uh, it's called QA and QC, is a quality control and quality assurance. So when the Corps of Engineers awards a contract, and, and, and I'll use that large uh, Belleville Hospital as an example, the Corps of Engineers is going to require the contractor to have a quality control person that works for the contractor on site to make sure that quality, uh, that whatever's being done, whether it's a concrete pour or painting an exterior, an interior wall, that there's somebody for that company that's overseeing whoever's doing that work. And they make sure that work is done in accordance with the spec. And then the Corps of Engineers is going to have uh, what is called a quality assurance person. It's, it's, uh, it, it could be a Corps of Engineers employee, or it could be, uh, Charles, a company that the Corps has hired to oversee contractors. Back, Brack was so large that the Corps didn't have enough CORs, contracting officers reps, or quality assurance people, uh, overseas. So the Corps actually went out and, and put out a small business set aside. 
company that did that type of thing. They didn't build anything, but they came in and they oversaw the work that was being done by contractors. So there is those those two things, it's QA, QC. Uh, the core also does a sponsor or a training session for contractors that basically trains them on how to administer a Corps of Engineers contract. Uh, and that's very useful, especially for companies who have never worked with the Corps of Engineers. It, it's good to understand how the Corps administers contracts, especially important to understand how to submit an in, a proper invoice because you want to get paid on time, right? So you want to know how to do that properly so you get paid uh, within the, uh, the, the, you know, the Prompt Payment Act de deadlines. Okay, any other questions? Yes. In your experience, when a small firm that has been successful wants to expand from a core competency facing the issue of fall, how have you seen small businesses do that in such a fashion that falls towards their acceptable? Okay. If you can't hire a sub to provide your expertise, how do you acquire the initial expertise in terms of hire someone that has it? Sure. Talk to their yeah, the question was how how uh, could a company that maybe doesn't have the qualifications to do a certain type of work uh, could venture into that to that type of work? Uh, one way to to do that is as you just said is to hire people who have done that type of work. If that person now works for you, works for your company, then that experience would be considered. Uh, by most Corps of Engineers uh, districts. Uh, they, they, they will look at the expertise of the individuals that work for that company. Another way that uh, companies gain that experience is they, they do subcontract work uh, for general contractors or others. It could be, uh, for, be uh, non-federal work. They, they're doing that work for, say, a commercial entity then they use that, that as experience uh, to present to a Corps of Engineers district. So there, there are several ways that that can be done. Yes, ma'am. Could you explain a little bit more regarding the WSC and WSC regarding set aside? I understand that you can't, would it only be set aside if you were to submit to the sort of the sort and to well, uh, her question was on the woman-owned small business set aside. How how does that work? Basically, let me go. Whoop, it didn't work. Go back. Let me see if I can find one of these women-owned small business set asides here. Yeah, here's one. Uh, woman-owned small business set aside out of the Fort Detrick, Maryland. Now, I assume what Fort Detrick did is they they put that in the Fed Biz Ops. Uh, well, first of all, they put it in the Fed Biz Ops mainly as a source of salt. Uh, I, I didn't see the source of salt. I just saw when, when the RFP came out. But they probably put it in there as a source of salt. It was in the NAICS code that they could uh, by far do a woman who was aside. There are some NAICS codes where they can't. General construction, as an example, 236-220 is, is the NAICS code for a general contractor. For whatever reason. Uh, you can't do a woman on city side in in general contractor, but for specialty codes like electrical, uh, plumbing, heating, you can. So in this case, I'm pretty sure what Fort Detrick did. They put it out as sources saw. Adequate women-owned companies responded, which is by far two or more, and they decided to go with a woman-owned small business city side. Now. Uh, so, yes, it, it probably was done as a result of a source of salt. doesn't necessarily have to be. Let's say that whoever was at Fort Detrick, uh, this was the Army, that Army contracting officer already knew of women-owned companies because they had come to this market them. So they had an internal list. I'm just saying this could work. This internal list. Yeah, yeah. May not have gone out as a source of salt. And based on internal but you're probably going to uh, women-owned suicides or other suicides as a result of a source of thought that's important for small business. Okay. Any other uh, questions? Any questions from the uh, audience out there? 
Okay. Oh, one one more question. The training session, you mentioned the training session that is offered. So mm -hmm. how do we find out about those training sessions? Are they on the um, no, that wouldn't be on FedBizOps. Uh, the way I would recommend you do that, if you're focused on a specific Corps of Engineers district like Norfolk, go ahead and contact the small business director there. I can give you his point of contact. His name is Adam Ball. Uh, I, 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 you email me. I'll give you Adam's uh, point of contact information. He can tell you who in the Norfolk district handles uh, that session. Hey, Jack, can you hear me? Yes, sir, I can. Uh, I came in late. I need to know a couple of clarification on your acronyms. MATOC, what is that? What's that stand for? MATOC is a multiple award uh, task order contract, which which means, uh, and let me go back if I can find one of those for you. Here, here's one right here. Can you see that screen? I can see it. I got your slide in front of me, yeah. Gotcha. Now, that's out of the Louisville district. Again, it's the largest service-disabled vet, MATOC, that I've, I've ever seen. Multiple award task order construction contract. It means Louisville is going to put that out there, restrict it to just SDBS, SDBO, SBs. Pick, uh, I think in this case, five of those, the, the, the top five. Then those, okay. top, then those top five will compete again what we call individual task orders for that $160 million worth of, worth of funding over the next five years. So it's a, okay. it's a multiple award to more than one contractor. Got you. And I guess the MACC is a multiple awards construction contract? That's right. Uh, that, that's the Navy's uh, term for it. It's just a few of the form of uh, what the FAR describes as an IDIQ. If you went to the FAR, F-A-R, you won't see the word MATOC or MAC. What you'll see is IDIQ, indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity contract. The Army and the Navy just puts acronyms on them. Okay. Um, another question flying up is, does your group help with bonding? Absolutely. Uh, as I said, when I, when I you got it a little bit late, but on my closing, I, I said I work for a bonding company, who I believe is one of the best is the best in the country in helping small businesses. It's called the Mahorsky Group. If you send yeah, me an email or uh -huh. call me, uh, I'll go to the, that slide if I can find it here. Here it is. That's my email address and phone number. Uh, I'll get you with the right folks who can help you with that. Are you based out of Quakertown, PA? They are, yes. I'm in Virginia. Okay. And um, I guess you don't know all the particulars on how they bond. Do they bond no. on the contract? Uh, they they will well they'll they'll give you a bonding what they call a bonding program. Yes, they will okay. give you individual bonds, bid bonds or performance of payment bonds. But you 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 would get as a company uh, a bonding program. You know they and, and I'm just using this as an example. They they may look at you, uh, at your uh, your financials, et cetera, uh, history. All that comes into play, but I can tell you one thing that comes into play that's that's about 50% of the decision-making process with the Mahorsky Group, and I went over it earlier, is honesty and integrity. They put a lot of emphasis on on the company owner and meeting with the company owner. It's about 50-50 on that. Then they're also going to look at, 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 at uh, financials, past performance history, et cetera, but uh, honesty and integrity is, is also a key. Okay. But, but I was going to say, they, they may look at your company, I'm just giving you an example, and say, we'll give you a $2 million single bond and $10 million aggregate. Okay. That, that, that's the way they set up a program. And then, individually, they'll, they'll meet with you. If, if you see a project, for example, that's over the $2 million single, single contract limit, and you say, this makes sense for me, it's something that I do well, it's $3 million, uh, nine times out of ten, they're going to give you that $3 million bond. Do you know, um, we're an 8A company, and we have a big project coming up. Do you know if they will utilize the um, aggregate experience of three partners to get the bonding? You know, I don't know. I'm not the bonding expert, to be honest with you. That hired me because of my, my contacts, people I know, companies I know, agencies I know. 
but I can get you in touch with the, with the right people who are bonding experts. Okay, and we can hire you too in those contacts, right? Yes. All right, thank you, sir. Thank you. Other questions? All right, it's been a privilege. I, oh, I'm sorry. I have a question. Yes. Jack, if a company is awarded an IDI2 contract from one district of the Corps of Engineers, can they market that IDI2 to other districts? Yeah. That's a good question. Joe asked me if a company is awarded an IDIQ by one district, can they market that IDIQ to other districts? And the answer is yes and no. If it's a service type contract, let's say it's an environmental contract, you're doing environmental work, environmental remediation, et cetera. For the most part, that contract can be used by any Corps of Engineers district. But let's say, and I'll use the MATOC at Arlington National Cemetery, it was a contract to do construction work at Arlington specifically. So uh, the Omaha district uh, would probably not be able to utilize one of those three uh, SDV SBOs to come out to, to uh, Omaha and do work in Nebraska. So it, it just depends upon the type of contract it is. Rule of thumb, if it's a service contract, you're providing a service, uh, a product, uh, you can do it anywhere. If it's a construction contract, it's probably going to be more uh, geographically restricted. Okay. Okay. Again, okay. I appreciate being here, uh, Joe and uh, Patricia. Thank you for inviting me, and I appreciate you folks uh, being here in the room. I have, do have two or three that were here in the room, and, of course, the people in the audience. Thank you. Thank, and thank you very much, Jack, for sharing your wealth of knowledge and your expertise and all these great opportunities. We appreciate you making up the trip as well. Okay. Small token of our oh, appreciation. And thank please, you, everyone, Patricia. join me in thanking Jack. Thank you. I appreciate it. And thanks again, to, as Jack said, to all participants on the phone and in the room. We look forward to you participating in additional sessions that we have in the coming months. Thank you.